Welcome everyone. We're going to take a look at a demonstration of tomatoes using watercolor. We get a look at the final product right now, but we're going to take a, a short stroll through the process. Uh, up next is the material list. Uh, feel free to pause and jot this down. Synthetic brushes or sable brushes are perfectly fine. Watercolor paper, I'm using 140 pound cold press, and there's my list of paint and some other materials that'll be needed. Now I'm getting started with a pencil drawing in 2H with a light wash over top of it to allow the paper white to be pushed back a little bit. I'm using the warm yellow, Windsor yellow, a little bit of burnt sienna, a little bit of blue, just to neutralize it. And once that's dry, make sure it's dry, I go in to the first tomato, mixing up a little bit of the Scarlet Lake and a little bit of the Windsor Blue Green, just to desaturate it a little. It's not perfectly uh, saturated. And I've saved a little white spot to bring that highlight out. And as I move around the form, I'll keep an eye on where that highlight is bleeding. And if I need to lift something out, I'll do that with a damp brush, not sopping wet. So dampen it on a paper towel and then lift out. Now I'm, I've let that dry with a hairdryer and I can go back behind it and cut the form out with a dark. And I'm bringing the value uh, a little bit brighter as I go, uh, introducing a little more saturation, a little more fluid uh, up, ne up near the top edge there. So I've got a gradient uh, created there. Now as I transition behind some of the, gr uh, the green, uh, the stems and such, I will make sure that there's some continuity there. So if I've mixed up a color, I want to make sure it continues behind uh, and meets up so it doesn't feel like it's a totally different part. I'm moving to the third tomato with a cooler wash. There's a lot of reflected light here. So I'm making sure that there's some temperature variance in these not just a single monochrome that um, might be boring potentially. You know, and overall this whole piece is going to be a full color palette. We're looking at my co-primary uh, setup here with two blues, two reds, and two yellows of varying temperature. So essentially it's a primary color palette. I do have some green, but ultimately you could mix that from the Windsor Blue Green and the Windsor Lemon pretty easily. This is essentially the first layer. So when we're looking at this, if you're really confident about things being bold and direct, you could potentially do a lot of your final work as one layer. But my working process tends to be a lot more layer upon layer, building the form up, uh, allowing some brushwork uh, to kind of play into things. But I am moving from foreground to background here in this case. It doesn't always need to be that way, but because it's a transparent medium, you can't end up just painting the background and opaquely painting a tomato on top of it. Um, so I wanted to make sure my main figure was cut out nice and clean uh, with the subsequent washes behind it. Now as I'm laying in the shadow, I've got varying temperatures. It's cooler and bluer on the left side and warmer on the right side as that tomato is connecting to it. Uh, there's a lot of scattering of the color from the tomato itself into the shadow. And I've softened the outer edge uh, with a ring of water uh, around it and let it bleed into it uh, versus a little bit sharper as it gets closer to the form. So I'm doing that again on this one. Softer edge on the outside and moving it a little bit warmer and redder as it comes closer to the form. I'll continue to reevaluate that space uh, because I don't want it to be too sharp or really too contrasty behind uh, because it is you know, recessed, it's further in the distance. And I'll use a paper towel every now and then to clean something up as needed. All right, so clean water around uh, the shadow, bringing it down, letting it overlap the form. Um, so you can see part of that uh, overlap there is also allowing for the shadow to reflect into the form of the tomato. And then it, whenever the outer edge or ring of that shadow kind of dries, I'll keep an eye on it. If it's drying to a hard edge and I don't want that, I'll go in with a rinsed out clean brush that's been dried on my paper towel a little bit just to soften it up. 
and you can sort of scumble it back and lift out a hard edge. So you want to be aware of your edges uh, at the end of the day. Second layers here are going in and adding a little more form, adding a little more saturation. As I'm looking at where the tomato is reflective, usually on the outer edges it's a little more reflective, uh, so you could find it a little bit brighter towards the outside. You can see the deepening of the shadow anchors that form to the ground, but I'm still looking for it to overlap a little bit, again, so that it reflects the shadow and doesn't seem to be a collaged element to cut out. Second layer on the front, building that core shadow. The first layer acts as a cooler layer, and so I'm bringing a little bit more Scarlet Lake into the mixture on the subsequent layers to increase the saturation and pull it away from the surface of the paper a little bit more. Darkening my cast shadow. It's a mixture of Windsor Blue Green and Scarlet Lake. We get this kind of neutral purple. Uh, and every now and then I'll throw a little bit of the ultramarine in there uh, because I like the way its sediment uh, kind of falls into the cracks of the paper. Moving around subsequent layers in the background, I'm going to be very conscious of the background so that it's atmospherically faded a little bit. I just want to push that atmosphere more than I actually see in person uh, to create that depth and space. And as we're looking down at this from the camera angle, the back tomato does feel a little bit larger just because of the board being tilted up to allow gravity to pull the washes downward. But it's an optical illusion right now. Introducing the green now, the stem, and it's essentially a flat wash. There's a little bit of variance because I didn't mix up a huge puddle and, you know, the actual stem isn't perfectly flat. But it's a, it's a local color, right? So first and foremost, I'm just washing it back, uh, making sure that if there was anything really bright, if there was a really strong highlight, I would save that. But there wasn't. It's all matte and kind of uh, fuzzy textured, if you will. The darker portions there on the outer edge, uh, those I knew would need to be applied loosely and quickly and wouldn't take subsequent layers very well, so I wanted to mix that up close to the final value. Alright, so making sure that I've dropped the colors in around and then bouncing back to the tomatoes, looking at how things have dried and needing to see that foreground element come forward a little bit more, pushing saturation, pushing value. And I'm not really necessarily leaving a hard edge anywhere. It's bringing a wash in, rinsing my brush, dampening it on the paper towel, and then finessing the edge away a little bit. Dropping some shadows, turning some form, and continuing to evaluate saturation. So I'll be continually playing that backwards in space like a grayscale just with saturation finessing some edges paying attention to uh, how something might recede behind another form and if it's too sharp I want to soften that making sure some of the stems are casting some shadows and really going in now and deepening in some of the details on the stems So it's two or three washes on the, the stems in general here for me. A local color, a dark, uh, and a mid-tone that might blur it a little bit and blend the form out. And then if I need to deepen any other darks, I can do that later. But I'll continue to see throughout the process how much detail is necessary, how much can I get away with not showing. So squint your eyes and look for those big forms that still are visible when you do that. really being cautious about some of the moments uh, because the red and the green are going to mix to a neutral if they overlap and I don't necessarily want a dark outline on something so being really cautious and careful with the brush but I'm mostly using the same brush the whole time it's a number eight round but it comes to a really good point so I can get some detail with it really try to use the biggest brush you can handle uh, throughout the process uh, I could have used a 10 at various times but 
the 8 was cooperating pretty well for me. But if I had felt at any point that the wash wasn't carrying far enough, I would have switched to something larger. But a, a big key is to not use a 3 the whole time, or you'll be uh, overworking things quite frequently. Save that 3 for pretty late in the game, if you will. The detail moments, the, the linear elements that might need to be added in. And so it really is a finesse game now at this point. It's primar primarily finished, and I'm making sure that the moments of form that I want to retain are still there. So again, I, I said I was going to keep looking at that space behind uh, the first one tucked in. I want it to fade out, kind of be depth of field, but I also want to make sure that it still feels like there's volume and form connecting to the surface at some point. And going in and hitting some of those cast shadows from the stem onto the tomato. That really helps give it a little bit more dimension. I bring the hairdryer in when I need it uh, to kind of continue working on the same idea. I don't want to move on and I want it to dry. So I can do that subsequent layer immediately. Pushing those shadows again a little bit more. Deepening some darks. Adding another detail element uh, to finesse where is the focus for the viewer? Where can something be faded away? And is there any confusion about something being flat or volume? Deepening the dark in the back. Got to do it in the front then. And that'll take us to the final piece again. We're going to pan across the surface and then show you what the actual still life looked like. I was working off to the left, which was not the most efficient way to do it. I try to make sure that my light source is blocked off, though, so the light to illuminate the filming doesn't interfere with the still life. And then a good shot of the scan. And I hope you all have a good time doing this. I look forward to seeing your work. Good luck, everyone.